I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. We're starting in Vancouver at their first safe stay village. It's a place for homeless folks. This used to be a place full of camps and tents, but now it's cleaned up, organized, and safe. We're going to take a look back at the last six months of this place to see what's worked and what hasn't. We're also going to take a look at Portland to see what's working or not there. But before we begin those, let's first talk with a woman here who says this place saved her life. I never had a, had a hard time up here, and then this year after COVID hit, that's just when everything changed for me, you know. Before moving into Vancouver's Safe Stay community in April, Courtney Ligman lived in a tent on a trail near Interstate 205. It's safe. It's safe compared to like my tent. I don't have to worry about people coming in and stealing my stuff. You know, when you're out living in a tent, you can't lock a door. And then if you have to leave to go anywhere, people are constantly going through your stuff trying to take from you. So, like, this is just like, you know, it's a safe place. The community marks six months of existence at the end of June. It's off Northeast 51st Circle near the YMCA. Volunteers like Sean Kingsbury keep the place looking nice. The city of Vancouver issued a report showing what worked over the last six months. Of 46 people served, 11 got jobs, 32 got access to health care, including physical, mental and behavioral health, 16 got ID cards, one got a high school diploma, 40 had housing assessments done, moving them a step closer to permanent housing. And of those, 14 moved into permanent housing, and 10 others are in the process of getting permanent housing. Jamie Spinelli is the Homeless Response Coordinator for Vancouver. I asked if 14 was a low number for permanent housing. I feel like it's a great number. I know, you know, numbers from shelter to housing tend to be kind of low. People, people tend to kind of stagnate when they move into shelter for a whole variety of reasons. They get comfortable there. You know, they've got some stability, so they want to stay. Um, because they're not out on the streets, they're not like the emergency focus for services, you know. Focuses tend to be um, placed on folks who are outside. So I feel like the numbers out of here are, are fantastic, 30%. That's a, good, that's a good rate. Mike Palmer is one of the people who used to live here. I'm going to be 55 years old. I've worked my entire life. I, we don't do any of the extracurricular stuff. We just work. And when, you know, you, when you work and you lose your home because you're a worker, it's kind of tough. He said he worked for a temporary job company but could not afford housing. He and his wife slept in parks near Camas until he heard about this safe state community. The couple stayed here for a while, then recently moved into their own apartment. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, I got a key to my own house. I can walk in and walk out and, you know cook my own food and do what I need. But if it wasn't for this place being a start line to get to that place, I would still be there. Besides helping people here, the city points out the community lowered police calls by 30 percent within a 500-foot radius of the community compared to the same time a year earlier. EMS calls to the community also dropped by 10 percent. Vancouver now operates two safe rest communities like this and has three more planned. The city of Portland has one safe rest community. It's near Multnomah Village in southwest Portland. It opened this last June, and by July, the federal government said the community violated a deed restriction the government had with the city. A city spokesman sent us a statement that reads in part, We've assembled a team, reviewed more than 100 sites, selected and secured permission for the use of six sites, opened one safe rest village, have two under construction, and the remaining three are in the planning permitting phase. Back in Vancouver, one thing that did not work, not everyone who arrived stayed. Eleven people left during that first six months. But don't try telling Courtney Ligman this place does not work. It changed her life. Just, I couldn't even look people in the face. I was like, I'd lost like a big part of myself. And I didn't even realize it until I came here. And I was like, oh man. And then starting to feel like yourself again, it just, I'm going to cry. But, you know, it's, yeah, getting your dignity back, it makes a difference. I get emotional because it's like, saved my life. Really Out in her tent, she felt less than human, her dignity and hope like stolen. Not anymore. This place definitely saved my life. And the people here are amazing. The staff is like, oh, you can talk to them about anything. You know, they just want to help. Like, they know that we're, like, not coming in here sober. Like, I was a massive alcoholic and meth addict when I came in here, you know. And they helped me go to Rainier Springs. They helped me to go to detox. They helped me with everything, you know. And the lady who helped save my life, she's the one who watched my dog when I went to rehab. So, like, yeah, they saved my life. 
you can tell it's had a huge impact. Thanks to Courtney and Mike for sharing their stories. It's inspiring to see a program that is working and people who are taking steps to improve their own lives and leave the streets behind. We magnify what's wrong when we see it, so it seems fair play to magnify what is right as well. Homelessness is not a hopeless problem. Vancouver's program looks like something that holds great promise, which is why leaders from cities around the country are now visiting to see what they're doing. We talk a lot about the Safe Rest Village plan and other solutions because lots of people are dying homeless here in Oregon every year. We now know that 207 people died during the first six months of this year. That's an average of about eight people each week in Oregon. Earlier this year, a new law went into effect that required the Oregon Health Authority to keep track of whether someone was homeless when they died. That's why we know that 207 people died throughout the state from January through June of 2022. 35% of those deaths happened in Multnomah County. Some of the other findings, January had the highest number of deaths, 48 homeless people died in Oregon during that month. Far more men have died without a home than women, 165 men to 42 women. And the highest number of deaths happened in people 55 to 64. Let's take a look at how people are dying. According to the data, 32 people died from injuries, eight were suicide, seven homicide. But the overwhelming majority of deaths are labeled as natural causes. Now that could mean a lot of different things. The report doesn't really break it down by illness, weather, or any other health factors. We talked about that with Scott Kiernan. He's the executive director of the Blanche House, which serves homeless people in Portland. My supposition is, is that there is no final cause of death, perhaps, for some of these instances and that maybe we will find out that they were the result of diseases or other conditions um, that we know are prevalent in the houseless community. There's a lot of hypertension, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, uh, people who have chronic illnesses, physical disabilities, uh, mental health challenges, addiction, the data also show that some people of color face a disproportionate danger living on the streets. Although the overwhelming majority of people who died this year so far are white, Native Americans represent more than 6% of homeless deaths, but they only make up uh, less than 2% of Oregonians. Black people who are homeless made up more than 4% of the deaths. The census report says they make up 6% of Oregonians. Kerman says he sees the danger people are living in every day. There's a lot of tragedy going on. Um, we had one of our meal guests murdered across the street in February. Uh, his name was James Wise. Uh, we have another meal guest who uh, was attacked recently. His name is Scotty. And we believe that, you know, they are not doing well from, from what we understand. So, you know, I think it, it just underscores that these are lives that are being lost. And um, I think we can say one way or the other, um, however, the cause of death has determined uh, housing insecurity and homelessness played a role. And while we're talking about the homeless, school in Portland starts in seven days. The mayor wants to move all homeless tents away from schools and away from the main routes the kids walk to get there. Now, that sounds like a great idea to a lot of people, but will it actually work? Some are skeptical. Here's Blair Best. About a week out from the start of the school year and dozens of homeless campsites around Portland are being posted for removal. I think it's a great idea. I think uh, it eliminates a lot of the concern, I think, for not just parents, but for people living in the neighborhood as well. The city is now removing campsites along streets students use while walking to and from school. They're notifying these campers 72 hours to 10 days ahead of the planned cleanup and offering them a shelter bed along with free storage for their things. They are prioritizing the camps near elementary and middle schools. Last week, they removed camps near Cleveland High School, Park Rose High School, and Child Peace Montessori School. I was very much for it. I'm very happy about that. It needs to happen. It's dangerous. We can't have these people around our children. Too unpredictable. Marty Reynolds has two children in Portland schools. They were once chased on their way to school by a man experiencing homelessness. It's out of hand and we need some change. We need our city government to make some serious changes so this Portland can be back to what it used to be. It's creating problems in a lot of neighborhoods. Rob has lived in Portland for three years and often goes to the park next to the Metropolitan Learning Center in Northwest. There's tents all over the place, um, which in itself isn't problematic, um, but I've also seen people here 
using drugs, openly using drugs in the middle of the day, um, even when school's in session um, at the school right next door. Now, the big question many people have is how is this ban on camping near schools going to be enforced? What makes this any different than any of the other camp removals happening across the city where they clear camps, but then new ones move right back in? Well, nothing. The mayor's office says the city's impact reduction program will remove camps near schools, but if new ones move in right behind them, they'll just post the site again for removal. Now, many don't think this is a system that will work. I don't have a lot of confidence in that. Um, just because I see other areas that they clear and people see it as a like a big victory and then it's refilled, it's back up and running again. I don't think that they're going to be able to maintain the ban on camping. Um, I don't think that they're able to maintain anything that they implement. As for those living on the streets just waiting to pack up and move, they understand the new rules, but don't have a plan as to where they'll go next. Homeless people don't need to be around schools when the schools are in session, period. Yesterday, Sheila you know, put her I mean, tent on the corner of Northwest Hoyt and 20th, one of the routes the city plans to clear. So I'm going to take it down, especially since you said that, uh, when does school start, do you know? About two weeks. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I don't, I want to, I mean, I'll obey the law as far as that goes, most definitely. We don't need all this trash, and we don't need all these dirty needles, and we don't all need these people all tweaking out. The mayor's office has received numerous complaints of camps in your schools, and they're asking anyone who sees a camp blocking access to a school to report it through PDX Reporter or 311. Now, it's also important to note that, yes, the city is prioritizing clearing camps near schools, but they're also continuing to remove camps in other parts of the city. Blair Best, KGW News. And from that, on to another constant problem, graffiti, a problem in Portland, certainly not going away anytime soon. Yesterday, we told you about a prolific tagger who was recently arrested and how Portland police are shifting the focus to arrest vandals who are accused of, quote, high volume graffiti. That suspect, Emile Laurent, is facing 25 counts of criminal mischief. He's been indicted by a grand jury, but he's not been convicted. Yesterday, many of you asked about penalties for people convicted of graffiti crimes, which fall under that criminal mischief category. Well, here's what the state law says. Criminal mischief in the first degree, Laurent is facing six counts of that, is a Class C felony. Each count comes with a maximum of five years in prison and a potential fine of 125,000 bucks. Criminal mischief in the second degree, Lorenz facing 19 counts of that, is a Class A misdemeanor. Each count is punishable by up to 364 days in jail and a fine of just over $6,000. So, if Laurent was convicted on all 25 counts and given the maximum penalty for each and every count, he'd be facing nearly 50 years in prison and a fine of more than $860,000. Of course, it's worth noting that there's no way he's going to get that kind of a penalty. It will depend on things like plea deals and community service, and the penalties are likely to be much smaller. But it is an interesting case and one that we're going to continue to follow. Now, your response to our story yesterday <laughs> spoke volumes. You want to know, you want to talk about what is being done about graffiti and what is not. It was overwhelming. And I think a lot of people like me are just simply fed up. So let's check in on some of your comments and voicemails. Number one, I think all citizens should be encouraged to call the police whenever they see somebody vandalizing, whether it's graffiti, et cetera. Um, two, I think businesses should, who have graffiti on their buildings should have a limited amount of time to clean it up, maybe a week or so. Three, I think they should raise the penalties for those people caught um, causing graffiti on buildings, signs, etc. Something pretty major, like maybe $10,000 per instance or something like that. All right, thank you, Kevin. Interesting that Kevin brings up the point of businesses having a limited amount of time to clean up graffiti because right now there is a section of Portland City Code that requires such cleanup. Businesses have 10 days to clean it up, and if they don't, the city can give what amounts to a warning, and if another 10 days go by and nothing happens, the city can then clean it up themselves and bill the owner. There's also a fine of 250 bucks for each instance if the graffiti is ignored. It is a complicated system, though, and it's clearly not being enforced and not working right now. Our next comment comes from a viewer named Art, who brings up an idea that many of you echoed as well. Make the vandals clean up their own mess. 
I would make a suggestion about the people who are doing all the tagging. What they should do is restore the original building to their original condition at their expense. They can earn money by picking up trash. They can earn money by cleaning up uh, homeless areas until they repay the individuals who have the building they had to clean up. If it's $6,000, make him pay it by earning the money to restore the original uh, building and publish it every night so everyone can see him so they have an idea of what the next person that gets caught is going to do. And pretty soon we'll have a clean city, both in tagging and in trash. Thank you, Art. That idea takes community service to the next level for sure, but it will take, what will it take, I guess, is the question that we need to ask. Is it going to have to be drastic measures to fix things, or are we going to keep doing things like before, which clearly is not working? Something to consider. One viewer named Melissa, though, feels a bit differently about all this. She worries what people consider graffiti and how it could affect what she says are positives about the city's aesthetic. She wrote in to say, please, please let graffiti art stay. It's part of city life and brings joy and wonder when people are allowed to artfully express themselves publicly, even if it is controversial. And she's not talking about pornographic imagery there. I guess I'm concerned she goes on about the slippery slope that could happen if all street art is considered graffiti. This could lead to the extinction of public murals. So. What do you think about all this? We'd love to hear from you. Do you want more enforcement, stiffer penalties? Mayor Wheeler likes his executive orders. Do you think he should issue one of those? Would that help? Something sure needs to change to help clean up the city. And it starts probably with an idea followed by action. So let us know what your ideas are. Email the story at kgw.com or leave us a vo voicemail 503-226-5090. A Northeast Portland staple for movies and entertainment, now a charred shell of its former glory. Roseway Theater is a really special place. Weeks after a three-alarm blaze, fire investigators say they finally know how the fire started. We're taking a look back at your memories and what the future holds for the Roseway Theater. That's next, when the story returns. Earlier this month, Portland's historic Roseway Theater was decimated by fire. 
And now we have an update on what sparked it. Investigators have ruled out arson. They say it was accidental. They believe it was an electrical problem that torched the building on Northeast Sandy in 72nd. The Roseway Theater goes way back and was coming up on 100 years of life before these flames. It was built in 1924. It was designed to handle more than 600 moviegoers. The first movies it showed, and let us know if you've seen these, were The Signal Tower and Please Teacher. Over the decades, owners kept the theater's charming original decor inside as well as its 1920s facade in a modern form. The theater could still seat around 300 people, just half as many as it once did in the roaring 20s. By the way, we owe a special shout out of thanks to the University of Oregon's theater project for tracking down a few historic photos and facts for us. The Roseway, alongside other historic theaters in Portland, like the Laurelhurst Theater and the Baghdad, managed to survive the pandemic shutdowns. But sadly, it was flames that made the once vibrant theater a charred shell. When we first brought you the story, you told us about your fond memories of the Roseway, including one man named Randall Hompson, who watched the building burn. The Roseway Theater is a really special place to me and to my son. And we've come here many times and it's, it was such a neighborhood kind of place where it was just really, it felt very intimate to come here. We just live a few blocks away. So then we were able to just walk here. We didn't have to worry about parking or anything. We just came, it was a reasonable cost and it was just a neighborhood, just a really nice, warm, sweet neighborhood theater. It's a, it's a neighborhood place that so many people have gone to over the years. And it's just like, it wasn't a big mega theater where we have six films playing here, right? It was just a one time thing and it just had such heart. And it's, it felt like the people that were working there had heart as well. And you can tell there were some hearts broken when it burned. Another message from Barb who grew up in the neighborhood. She says that in the late 50s and early 60s, parents in the neighborhood would buy scripts for their kids to see movies every Wednesday in the summer. We all walked up to the theater together for a 1 p.m. movie. Kids were lined up around the block to get in, she wrote, and we watched the Three Stooges, Tarzan, and Francis the Mule movies. We each got a quarter to buy candy from the lobby glass case, so we filled up on milk duds, good and plenty, spearmint leaves, junior mints, orange slices, sugar babies, and more. Later as a teenager and student at Madison, the Roseway was a popular destination for Friday and Saturday date nights. Barb, we love reading about that. Portland Fire and Rescue says their investigation now is over. The private investigators are going to take it over now and analyze the scene and try and pinpoint exactly what went wrong in the electrical system. At this point, we, it's unknown if the theater's ownership is going to be able to rebuild. But we'll keep an eye on this story as well and see if the Roseway can make an epic comeback, maybe in time for its centennial celebration in 2024. That'd be cool. Still ahead on the story, a bug just five millimeters long, that's not long, trapped in time for 100 million years, finally discovered and identified by an OSU researcher. How the little insect creatively captured prey and how it evolved to avoid becoming prey after the break.
Well, bugs surround us every day, but it's not every day that you find a long extinct one that dates back 100 million years. Researchers at Oregon State University helped identify the creature that had a very unique way of seeing the world. Tim Gordon introduces us to the bug and one of the researchers who named it. This insect with the elongated body and head has a complicated name I won't attempt to pronounce, but I could tell you it's 100 million years old, preserved in fossilized tree resin or amber. And it fascinates OSU Professor Emeritus George Poinar. Poinar has seen and discovered a lot in his long career as a researcher and entomologist. One of the best parts about this insect is the eyes. And I'd never seen any animal before that had eyes that were sitting up on it, fetacils, so it could see 360 degrees with both eyes. Professor Poinar says the 360 degree vision must have been great for this five millimeter long bug to spot prey. And at the same time, it could see if other predators were coming. Poinar and two others wrote up a paper on the bug that was published in the Bio One Complete Journal last month. Along with a lot of research, it gives a couple other good looks at the well-preserved insect. Now this is very, very interesting. These are called uh, fungiosa spongiosa. The 86-year-old professor is talking about the lower portion of the front legs, which the team determined produced and excreted a sap that helped capture the bug's prey. Poinar says the amber encased creature was obtained from someone in China, but figuring out its history and naming it was a thrill. Well, it's great. It's like, it's like you're walking through a forest and all of a sudden you see something that you never saw before. Of course, in this case, you're walking through a forest that's 100 million years old. Seeing something nobody's ever seen before. Tim Gordon, KGW News. Super cool. All right, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. When we come back, the new school year is fast approaching. How you can help make sure kids have the supplies they need. Our Hey Help campaign is the KGW School Supply Drive. We're trying to raise enough money and supplies for more than 15,000 kids. And one of the best and easiest ways you can help is to give online. You can do it right now, in fact. Grab your phone, aim your camera at the QR code there on your screen, and then donate on our website. 
There's also a list of collection partners in your area where you can give in person if you'd rather do that. And if you don't have your phone right now, just remember, it's kgw.com slash school. Well, that's the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. We really enjoy having you here with us. And remember the story, our story? Well, that never ends. I'll see you tomorrow.